Um, and when I come back in the future, it's going to be different. Uh, I'm an emergency physician in Calgary, Alberta. I sit on the analgesic committee for that, uh, for our group. And uh, I care a lot about climate change, but I also care a lot about pain. Um, well, other people's pain. Um, and, and actually fixing pain, not causing pain. So that's why I have an interest in this talk. And I feel like there's a little bit of a, a circularity to this talk because the last time I was at the SRPC event was in 1999 in St. John's, Newfoundland. Was anybody there in 1999? I guess that shows how old I am. I was a resident and somebody from Purdue Pharmaceuticals was there and guess what they were talking about? Opiates in non-palliative chronic pain. And it was the first time I'd ever heard of that, and I totally ignored everything they said. I thought it was garbage. And then we had an opiate crisis, thanks to Purdue Pharmaceuticals sending people around the world to make talks like that. So I just want to say I have nothing to disclose. Nobody's paying me any money to be here. Um, the main drugs I'm going to be talking about are ibuprofen and acetaminophen in Canada. They're produced by Pfizer and Johnson & Johnson, and I don't care if you use the generics or whatever, but the main gist of my talk is use a lot more ibuprofen and Tylenol, and we're underusing topical NSAIDs. Okay, we're done. Have a good day. Um, so I think every physician consider themselves to be an expert in pain, right? Like we all know what the best pain drugs are, like Toradol, right? Everybody put your hands if Toradol is the best drug out there. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, Tylenol 3s, who, who likes Tylenol 3s? No, nobody? Okay, we'll talk a little bit about Tylenol 3s. Um, but, but what's interesting is most of our uh, knowledge on analgesics is, come, is expert, expert knowledge. And mostly it's somebody we worked with. We worked with some mentor at some point in our life who said, you know, Ketorolac is just the bomb. Like, you got to use Ketorolac. It's awesome. Um, or I really like this narcotic because it's so much better than that narcotic and it's just this these opinions that are out there but they're not really based on any evidence so is there evidence for which drugs we should be using so let's go for a couple cases the first is a 23 year old male with acute back strain unable to move out of bed 10 out of 10 pain no red flags you ask him what pain medications does he use he said none because i want you to to diagnose me and if i hide the pain i'm yeah. Anybody seen that patient before? Um, or a 67-year-old female with acute knee strain. Um, totally normal exam. The ligaments are fine. You did an x-ray just to make sure there's no fracture. It just shows some osteoarthritis. It's probably been there forever. And what are you going to give to those patients? So I want you to think in your mind which medications you would use in these two scenarios. Right in the eMERGE. And, and just to preface thing, this is very much an acute pain talk and not a chronic pain talk, they're very different disorders, acute pain versus chronic pain, or very different symptoms, I guess. And, and I don't think there's some crossover, but not a lot of crossover in those. So I'm really going to be focusing on eMERGE-style acute pain. OK, everybody's got a plan in their mind. We'll see if that changes during the talk. So this are, these are my objectives. We're going to talk about the evidence. We're going to actually use the Cochrane database. Um, there's an Oxford lead table, which was kind of a compilation of that. It's no longer, I don't even think it's online anymore, but it was a really good resource and how I certainly got into this. We're going to really dig down into NSAIDs. Whenever we use medications, there are risks to medications and there are benefits to medications. Everything has risk and benefit. And what we're trying to do is optimize that balance. It's not that great to have a highly beneficial drug that has high risks. I mean, we don't also don't want one that has zero risk but also doesn't benefit. Uh, so we're going to talk about some of the side effects of NSAIDs. We're going to talk about the bone healing issue. Um, and then we're going to talk about combination analgesia. Acetaminophen with codeine, acetaminophen with ibuprofen, and then uh, ibuprofen and acetaminophen with, with oxycodone. Um, I tried to find the worst pictures. <laughs> so... Um, so the Oxford League table, uh, so this was a, the Oxford um, pain site was um, uh, funded to look at evidence-based analgesia. It was actually from the University, Oxford University, um, and it was really based on the Cochrane collaboration. I don't think they put anything up on since 2013, but I have updated all the data um, from the most recent Cochrane collaboration um, reviews that are out there. Um, so we're, what we're looking at is... 
blinded, randomized, comparison versus placebo, single dose studies in patients with moderate to severe pain. And just to clarify this moderate to severe pain, these are predominantly post-tonsillectomy patients or post-dental extraction patients because what we're really trying to do is find really standard acute pain, and that's, that's a good way of causing pain are those two, uh, those two surgical procedures. <laughs> so I'm, you're going to see this table a lot, and I want to break it down for you. Um, so on the far left is whatever the analgesic we're looking at compared to placebo. And then the next column is the number of patients in the review. So remember, these are meta-analysis, so these are combination of multiple studies. The percentage with at least 50% um, pain relief over a four-hour period. So that's kind of what we're aiming for. We want to have at least 50%. So we want to have at least... We want our patients to have at least 50% pain relief during a period of time. And then we translate that number into a number needed to treat, and then there's a confidence interval. And all of these things are important to understand what the evidence is. We're going to even break this down a little further. So somebody just comes out of uh, their tonsillectomy. They're waking up. Bam, you give them an analgesic or a placebo. And it has to be placebo because that's how we find the evidence. And you're going to wonder, what's the ethics of using um, a placebo. Well, the first thing is, is 18% of people get at least 50% pain relief just with, an, just with a placebo. And in all of these trials, there's going to be a rescue analgesic that can be given one hour after the original an an uh, analgesic is used. Because even those people that are getting the intervention, the actual medication, some of them are going to have inadequate pain relief. So that's how we work the ethics of this. So every half hour, every 15 minutes, you ask them what their pain is, and then you just do a graph. So at zero, it's four. Um, sorry, that that's, this is pain relief. So um, verbal rating scale of pain relief. At zero, they have generally you're going to have none. They have no pain relief. And then at one hour, they might be at two. And at three hours, it might be at four. And then down at four hours, it might be back at two again. And what you're calculating is that area under the curve. So you're, this is the, this, this triangle is kind of imaginary, but if you can imagine some kind of shape here, you're looking at that volume over the entire pain relief. So ideally, you give the medication, two seconds later, their pain is totally gone, so they go up to four, and it remains there for six hours, and then at six hours, you're, you're done the, the study. So if you had perfect analgesia, you'd have 100%, right? It'd be top par over max top par times 100 would be 100%. But we're really aiming for at least 50% over that four to six hour period. Does that kind of make sense? So then what you're going to do is you're going to make a graph of that. So, you know, five people have 20% pain relief and 100 people have 70% pain relief. Some people go all the way to 100. Um, and you're going to do that for the blue squares, which are the intervention. And then the white squares, which is placebo. And you're going to compare it. And that's how you get your number needed to treat, right? So 50% have 50% pain relief, or 50, 50 patients, one over that, minus two, equals 2.6. So great. Now you know your number needed to treat is 2.6. So you have to treat 2.6 patients with ibuprofen 400 in order to get at least 50% pain relief, 50% of patients with pain. Does that make sense? Kind of? All right, so let's just throw up some numbers here. And this is graph is to show you some of the limitations of this data because meta-analyses aren't perfect. So if we look at oxycodone compared with paracetamol, the numbers are all over the place. So if you look at five of oxycodone with just paracetamol is the British term for acetaminophen, just in case you guys are confused. Um, and you add 300, and, or you add another 650 of, of, ibupro, or of, of paracetamol to that, it pops up to there. And then you add another five, it pops up to there. But for some reason, these two numbers are exactly the same. And this number is way smaller. Like this, this doesn't make any sense at all, right? Like you shouldn't have better pain relief with half the medication that you're giving here. 
So I'm just using that to demonstrate that this isn't a perfect world. So you have to take a little bit of uh, grain of salt. But some of the things you can look at is um, the number of the patients in the comparison. Like, <coughs> if you're comparing these two, there's only like 240 people in the two groups total. And that's not a particularly great sample size. So pay attention to these numbers. I trust this number way more than I trust this number. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, a lot of blank faces, but you'll see it as we go along. Okay. So I'm just going to briefly talk about IM injections because they do have the data for that. They don't have anything for IV. But um, I'm just mentioning that this is, I'm predominantly focused on oral, oral medications in this talk. But just to see that generally all the medications are the same. Um, all these narcotics are the same. And we actually, there's more evidence recently that shows that Ketorolac 10 is exactly the same as Ketorolac 30. So there's a bit of old data here. But in our department, we no longer use Ketorolac 30. We just use Ketorolac 10. Side effect versus benefit, risk versus benefit. So the risk of 30 is much more than the risk of 10, and there doesn't seem to be any better benefit from using the higher dose. All right, so now we're getting into the meat of things. This is super small, and I don't expect you to read it, so I'm going to read off some of this stuff for you. Um, this, this is all NSAID. At the, and, and paracetamol, or acetaminophen. And these are all the number needed to treat in, in here. And you can see some of these numbers are huge. Aspirin, 5,000 patients. Ibuprofen, 200, 3,000 patients. Ibuprofen, 4,000, 6,000 patients. So the bigger the number, the tighter the confidence interval, and the more you can trust this number. Let's spend a lot of time talking about this table. The first thing I want you to look at is the acetaminophen. 4.6 for 600, 3.4 for 500, 3.5 for 1,000. So it's a moderately good but not great pain reliever. It um, doesn't seem to have a huge dose response curve. 500 is about the same as a gram. There may be a little bit. Uh, but not a huge dose response curve. Um, and then if you look over here at this relative risk adverse rate, and let's just get it out of the way. These are all about one. They're all pretty boring. The only exception to that would be, and I don't think I have it on here, is aspirin um, at one, oh, I do have it on there, at 1.6. So anybody using aspirin for pain relief? <laughs> These days, no. It's pretty obvious that there's the risk benefit just not there. Okay, so let's look at some of the other drugs. Um, let's look at some of the NSAIDs. So aspirin is here, and 1,200 is here. Nobody would ever use 1,200. Um, sorry, I've got the, the names cut off here. It's a bit hard to see. Um, ibuprofen, 50, 100, 400. 600 and 800 up there. But just note that the 800 only has 60, 76 patients in the room. There's only one study. Can you believe that on 800? Um, naproxen, I'm sure people are using naproxen. Um, 3.4, 2.7. Um, Ketorolac 10, orally. Ketorolac 21.8. Um, diclofenac 25, 100. So some of the trends that you can see here is that there does seem to be a dose response curve to, ibupro or to uh, NSAIDs versus the acetaminophen group. So the higher the dose you give, the better pain relief you have. Any questions about this chart? We're going to dig into this a little bit more as we go along. So NSAIDs are great. And right now, uh, 1.6 uh, ibuprofen 800 wins for whatever that's worth with 76 patients in that trial. There was one other group of medications that was as good or better than ibuprofen. Anybody practice in the early 2000s when the COX-2s were around, like the valdecoxibs and the rofecoxibs? 
Um, I remember hearing a story that the, the Calgary uh, Stampeders football team loved those drugs. They would just take them before the game. They would, uh, if they had any injury, they could just play through it. It was amazing. Um, the only problem is it killed you. <laughs> so it worked really well, but that risk-benefit ratio wasn't really there. Um, this is just another way of looking at it. Um, just looking at the number needed to treat, just a different visual for you to see the different the, the trends there. And we're going to talk a little bit about this. Even better than ibuprofen 800 is combination ibuprofen and Tylenol. So I'm just going to keep saying that that's really good. Um, and this is another visual representation of that ascending um, benefit of the dosing of, uh, of ibuprofen. So, no, I guess I can look at this one here. Um, and that's more ibuprofen. So the, the reason why I'm bringing this up is predominantly to look at this one drug of eight, the dosing of 800. Um, the reason why its uh, number needed to treat is so high is look at the relief that they had. 100% of the patients got um, at least more than 50% pain relief. And I can't imagine that that would be replicated in other studies, but I'd really like to see what it is. Because I personally use ibuprofen 800 for myself, and I use it for my patients, and it seems to do well. Has anybody heard about this analgesic ceiling of ibuprofen at 400? Yeah, somebody back there. It's, it's, it's certainly a myth that's out there. That's based on one dental study that um, the, the analgesic in that one study didn't seem to make a difference whether it was 400 or, or above that. Yeah? The placebo is a lot prettier in the last two studies. Than yeah, first that's a good point. So I, what that would mean is that this number should actually be lower, right? Because if this was 18% like the average is, that would make this number even lower. So that's a good point. We need more studies. All right, so everybody knows about the risks of, of, um, of NSAIDs. Um, I'm not gonna touch much on the renal risks of NSAIDs. Um, for myself, I don't tend to use it in older patients and I don't tend to use it in uh, NSAIDs in anybody who has compromised renal uh, function. And I think that's just a general good safety procedure. Just just stay away from anybody that's got uh, a higher GFR or a lower GFR. Are you waiting for a treatment before you give them analgesia? Depends on the age. If they're over 65, for sure. Um, if they seem, if they're like you, young, healthy, I, I'm not sending blood work on somebody with an ankle sprain. No, <laughs> just giving them the drugs. Um, so, just to put the GI risks in perspective. Um, this is from a, about, oh, there's no laser pointer on this, but this, this is from a while ago. This is probably from 15 years ago. Um, so 10 million prescriptions. So that doesn't even count the non-prescription use of NSAIDs in Canada. Um, so even with the, the prescription NSAIDs, um, you have about 4,000 emissions a year and about 400 deaths. So I'm not negating those 400 deaths, but just to put it in perspective, we use a lot of these drugs and we do have some badness that comes from it, but in perspective, it's, 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 um, you know, we want to minimize those, the number of people we kill, for sure, um, but it's, it's not an outrageous number considering how much it's being used. Are those just GI-related, NSAID-related deaths? Does that account for yeah. the cardiac side of things, or this is just GI-bleeds? Just GI-bleeds. Okay. Um, and then, um, just... This is just some data from this study here to show that the duration is really important. The longer you're using these, um, and this, these are um, not clinical um, diagnoses, this is scope diagnoses. Not patient-related data, but, um, but scope-related data. Uh, and the longer you, you use them, the, the higher the risk of having ulcers. Is that assuming you're using a like, max dose? Uh, I, I don't believe so, but it is regular dosing. And this is more for chronic pain. That's, that's 96 before everyone is on a PPI. Sorry, say that again? Sorry, that's 96 before everyone is on a PPI is 
Well, right, and we're going to talk about PPIs um, in two slides, I think. So the other thing to, 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 that when you're using these is you need to factor in the risk of, for the patient. So what are the four big risks? Um, CHF, age more than 75, a history of ulcers, <coughs> and a history of GI bleeds. So if they have none of those, uh, the risk is 0.8%. If they have one of those, it's 2%. If they have all four, it's 18%. So one in five patients. So my general rule is um, if they have any one of, especially these two, I don't use them. If they're older, I need to use some kind of protectant. Um, and just you got to think about this when you're going. I'm very, very reticent to use this in older patients, which is hard because a lot of older patients have a lot of pain. So... GI protectants, misoprostol was the drug we used forever. Um, what's interesting is the number needed to treat of 83 to prevent one GI bleed, number needed to harm of 20. Now, granted, it's worse to have a GI bleed than to have some diarrhea, abdominal pain, and flatulence, um, but it's still unpleasant. And number needed to treat of 83, that's huge, right? Um, and if your risk is higher, the number needed to treat will fall. So this is an all-comers number. So uh, if you're that group of, with all four risks, your number needed to treat drops to 12.8. Um, lots of evidence that shows that the H2 blockers, ranitidine, famotidine, those drugs don't make a difference, so don't even bother with those. Um, and then the, there's increasing evidence that PPIs are the way to go. So a number needed to treat of three in this one study versus six for misoprostol. And this is looking at people that actually had ulcers that had to be put on NSAIDs. So there, that's a huge risk. Does that all make sense? So, um, so this is just to look at the various um, types of NSAIDs and what the risks are. So there are three different studies that are looking at them. Two are Italian. Um, and the table that I, that I want you to look at over on uh, the first two columns, that ibuprofen was the base. So they were comparing everything to ibuprofen. That's why one is for ibuprofen. And in, in this study, placebo was the, was the um, control group. So it's pretty evident that uh, diclofenac is not super bad. This is a 2.7, not a 27. And... Uh, indomethacin is kind of nasty, and Ketorolac is horrific. I mean, this is a relative risk. So that's 25 times worse than, plac than placebo, uh, 12 times worse than ibuprofen. Like, those are big numbers. Yeah? You know, I've got that in the next slide, so just one sec. Right, and we're going to talk about Ketorolac and parental use coming up. And I don't discount that Ketorolac is the only IV source, but how often do we really need to use IV in the emergency room? Really. I use it in two kinds of patients, three kinds of patients. Those are NPO, those that are vomiting and can't tolerate oral meds and those that are so incredibly in pain that I better get on it in the next five minutes and not in the next 45 minutes. So the vast majority of patients I'm giving oral. Because how many people fit one of those criteria in your eMERGE? Yeah? Can you use Ketorolac for any pain or just for muscle I can use for any pain. And in fact, I would argue that for somebody with biliary colic or appendicitis, we should be using a lot more IV Ketorolac. Um, because one of the problems is we're using, a, the alternative is IV narcotics. And we know what the risks of those are, dysphoria, nausea, itchiness, addiction, I mean, the list goes on, right? Sedation. Um, so I think we should be using IV Ketorolac for sure in those patients that are being admitted. But 98% of the patients I see are going home. So why would I use it for them? So here's uh, the question about dosing. Um, I don't think naproxen's on there. Uh, but you can see there's uh, definitely a, a dose-related. Um, so this is estimates of the effect of dose on the odds ratio of upper gastrointestinal bleeding 
no surprise, paracetamol, there's no real relationship to that. Um, diclofenac, definitely a dose relationship. Um, ibuprofen, intermethacin, naproxen. So if, I don't know if you guys can see, but diclofenac goes from 2.2 to 12.2. Ibuprofen goes from 1.1 to 4.6. Intermethacin goes from 3.2 to 20.4. Dep uh, naproxen is 5.4. Uh, sorry, 4.8 to 15.6. So definitely a dose relationship there. And once again, ibuprofen wins. Like there's a reason why ibuprofen and naproxen are over the counter. It's not that they're worse drugs. It's that they're better drugs. It's that the risks are so low that they've felt that there's no need for us to have to prescribe these drugs. And so now we've got a drug that's super effective, over the counter, cheap, with a low side effect profile. Ibuprofen and naproxen are winning. And the main difference between those two, I would say, is dosing. So if you have somebody who prefers to take things twice a day because they forget all the time, then naproxen's the way to go. And if you have somebody who prefers to take the pain medications when they need it, then ibuprofen's the way to go. Does that make sense? Um, the other thing that we hear all the time, especially from our orthopod colleagues, is that you can't give NSAIDs and fractures because there's a risk of um, non-union. And the, the data is pretty good if you're a rabbit or a rat. Um, there's definitely an effect there. No effect on Coley's fractures. Spinal fusion surgery. Anybody doing spinal fusion surgeries here? No. Um, uh, I can't remember what... This was um, femoral diaphysis, so um, hip, uh, femor, femur fractures. Um, and this was fusion rates as well. Um, so um, what I take from this is if it's a, um, a fracture that's pretty common, like Coley's fracture, something where the non-unions are pretty rare, I don't have any concern with this. Probably wouldn't use it for non-surgical shoulder um, fractures, um, femur fractures, um, something where uh, they really need good callus formation. The, the two ends are far apart, and we're worried about bringing them together. Um, those are the ones that I would have some reticence in using this. But the vast majority of fractures you're going to see in your practice that you're sending home and then are not getting surgery, I think this is fine. Um, so we see a lot of um, celecoxib being prescribed. I see it in young people. Um, I'm not sure why it's being prescribed. Uh, I don't tend to prescribe it because I think ibuprofen is a better drug. And if I'm going to be using an NSAID, um, I'm going to use it with a PPI. And I think the evidence supports that um, it's about the same. So. Uh, you could consider it, but it's, 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 I think generally if you're going to use, um, if you want to protect the stomach, the PPI is going to be just about as good. Um, the other thing that's interesting about celecoxib for those people that are prescribing it, the reason why it's still on the market and that it's not killing as many people as the old ones did is because it's not a very good selective COX-2 inhibitor. Um, it's pretty weak. Um, so it, I think it can really be considered in the same class as most of the NSAIDs. Okay, topical NSAIDs. Anybody using topical NSAIDs acutely? Oh, I love to see that. I think this is totally underused. I think we just forget about them sometimes. We're so used to using the mouth. Um, but uh, it's really good for superficial pain. Like if the bony structure or the muscle structure that you're using is is quite near the surface. I don't know if it'd be very good for, for hip pain, for example, but it's great for knee pain, great for shoulder pain. Um, and the number needed to treat is 1.8. If you look, remember the, the chart that I showed you earlier, like the best was 1.6 with ibuprofen, um, and 1.8 was way up high. Like, this stuff works. And what's amazing is the uh, number needed to harm is one, like relative risk versus placebo is, is, is the same as placebo, both for local effects, like um, rashes and that kind of thing, and systemic effects. So um, even for um, chronic pain, so this is for acute pain, 
the 1.8. For chronic pain, number needed to treat of about 6.4. And that's for 50% pain relief, not over a six hour period, but over an eight to 12 week period. So still pretty good considering, yeah. This is the Elmugel um, diclofenac. I can't remember what ex Yeah, I'm afraid I can't tell you that. I could look it up for you. Um, because I've got this study, easily, I can easily find it after. Yeah. yeah. I can look that up at the end of the talk. Not sure what's going on there, but. Okay, Tylenol 3s, codeine and, and acetaminophen. Uh, how many? A quick question yeah. Fine. Yep, that's a very good alternative. If it's, I don't know about anaphylaxis, no. but for GI bleed complications, this is a great option. Great option. And what about your renal patients? The systemic absorption say it's about 2% um, of the bioavailability for oral, so I think it would be okay. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that this, the, the, the data that I'm looking at is the commercially available. Yeah. All right, so we're still seeing a lot of Tylenol 3s being prescribed. So the question is why? I think the reason is, is because it's a narcotic that you don't have to do a triplicate prescription for. And so we're really lazy. We don't want to fill out that whole thing. We can just slap a patient sticker on there, write T number three, MIT 100 tabs, and they're out the door. It takes two seconds. Um, the reason why, have you ever wondered why it's not a triplicate prescription? Sorry? Caffeine. Well, you can get it without caffeine, so that's not it. It's because the side effect profile is so bad that in order to get high off of codeine, the side effects become intolerable. Isn't that amazing? Like, that's really the, the truth behind it. Um, the same with tramadol, for the record. Um, so, so let's look at this. Placebo versus placebo has a number needed to treat of infinite because that's the way it works. 18% uh, pain relief over 50 minutes. Codeine 60. Maybe remember we were looking at number needed treats of 3, 4, and 2 in the past. Uh, codeine 60, which is the narcotic in acetaminophen, is 12. Number needed to treat 12. And that's a huge number of patients in that trial, 2,400. So you can really trust that number. Um, paracetamol, I'm just putting that up for comparison, because that's the equivalent of two, two Tylenols, right, is 650, is 4.6. So when you combine them, you go from 4.6 to 3.9. So where's the money in the, in the Tylenol 3s? It's all in the acetaminophen. It's not in the codeine. And the important thing also to look at is that risk on this side. Not surprising, <laughs> acetaminophen here and here, it's one. As soon as you add codeine, it goes to 1.6, which is significant. But the codeine alone is only 1.3. The codeine alone is only 1.3, yeah. But all of this is meta-analysis data, so you're gonna have to do some interpretation. I think you're pretty confident if you look at acetaminophen, 600, 500, and 1,000 all being around one, and this being 1.3, 1.4, 1.6, and 1.4, um, it's pretty evident that, that the codeine has an, is an issue. Um, it's quite interesting that according to the data, uh, one gram of acetaminophen <laughs> with 60 of codeine is 2.2, but I'd point out again that that number suggests that we can't really trust that data. We can trust this data, it's, it's almost 10 times the amount. So that's really what we need to look at. All right, uh, this is another uh, uh, example of the risks. So single dose studies, number of patients reporting more than one event. Um, this is, let me just make sure I get my numbers correct. This, um, this is the codeine 
side, this is the non-coding side, and this is multi-dose studies, and this is single-dose studies. So single-dose, there really isn't a big difference. It's really in those multi-dose where you see quite a huge increase in, in the side effects. Uh, constipation being the most common. How many people have seen somebody come into the eMERGE with <laughs> uh, fecal, needing a fecal disimpaction from, time, uh, from codeine? Um, and nausea is a huge thing in the multi-dose studies. There's a question back there. Is there any data on, I guess, like, is there adverse events, things like nausea, That's interesting because I, I don't see that where I practice um, at all. Percocets, for sure. Um, hydromorphone, dilaudid, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of that. We're not seeing codeine being abused as much. And I don't know if that's just a difference in location. We're seeing a lot of gabapentin abuse, which is really weird. Uh, the gabapentin abuse? Um, I don't know. I think it's, I think what I, th I guess is that it's being prescribed a lot more. I mean, this is not a drug of abuse that people are getting from um, China. It's, it's from a prescription. Well, maybe physicians are trying to, to avoid opiates for chronic pain. Yeah. Um, my understanding is coding metabolism is wildly distributed, like variable. 30% of people do not have the enzyme that's required to, to, uh, transmutate the codeine into morphine, which is how it works. And so when you're looking at this data, um, you have to factor that in. But when you're prescribing this drug to a patient, you don't know if they're that 30%. So for sure, for 70% of the population, it might be a much better drug than for, for those 30%. And the one time I do prescribe Tylenol 3s is somebody who says, you know what, this drug works for me. Please give me this for my ankle sprain, but I don't prescribe uh, narcotics for ankle sprains, but say uh, Coley's fracture or something like that. That'd be the one time I would prescribe it. Uh, Tramacet, anybody using Tramadol, Tramacet? Um, the nice thing about Tramadol and Tramacet is that it's way more expensive, so it makes the pharmaceutical companies way more money. But it doesn't work any better than Tylenol 3s. It's been marketed as a non-narcotic narcotic or a non-narcotic analgesia. But it, if you actually look in um, the, the drug monograph, it has all the side effects of a narcotic, addiction, constipation, nausea. I think you just need to consider this as a narcotic, um, an opiate. And you see that the number needed to treat for the, um, is, is slightly better than codeine 60, but not great, certainly not nearly as good as the NSAIDs. Um, and um, these are the confidence intervals. And number needed to harm is pretty huge. For vomiting, 12. For nausea, 7. And somnolence, 11. Um, I've never taken it, but I've, seen, I've, I've talked to people who find that somnolence, somnolence really a big issue. Serotonin syndrome Yeah. Risks. So NSAIDs and acetaminophen combined, anybody using this? Great, I'd love to see that. Um, in South Africa, I know, and probably other parts of the world, you can actually buy a pill that's the combined acetaminophen with ibuprofen, which I think is a great idea. Um, so there's definitely evidence that if you add ibuprofen to acetaminophen, that there's big benefit with that. There's not as great evidence that it, if you add acetaminophen to ibuprofen, um, that there's a benefit. Just out of curiosity, anybody know how acetaminophen works? Like what part of the pain cycle? Sorry? COX-3. COX-3. Anybody else? Yeah, anybody have no idea? Put up your hand. <laughs> You're just like the scientists, because nobody knows how acetaminophen works. Isn't that cool? They don't think COX-3s actually exist. I was looking at it this morning. Um, <laughs> Some, some guy about 10 years ago said, there must be a COX-3, but there doesn't seem to be a COX-3. Um, they're thinking maybe it's something central, but nobody really knows. Um, so let's look at some of the numbers for this. Um, so this, this is 400 of ibuprofen with a gram of acetaminophen, or 200 
ibuprofen with 500 of acetaminophen. Pretty good numbers, 500 in each trial. Number to treat of 1.5 and 1.6. But you know what really stands out for me? This is that relative risk we were looking at earlier. It's less than placebo. Relative risk of 0.6 or 0.7. I don't know if I've ever seen that with a medication being better than placebo. Like it, and, and these are big trials, like 500 people in the meta-analysis. This data seems to be strong. One of the things they're arguing is that because the ibuprofen uh, and the acetaminophen are working so well, maybe um, either, like you get nausea just with pain, right? So maybe they're getting decreased nausea because their pain relief is so good. Or maybe there's some kind of intrinsic anti-nauseant in the mechanism of the medications working together. Yeah? Same time, same time. This is that tonsillectomy, wake up, you get the drug, and then you follow it over that four to six hour period. That's, this, that's exactly what this is. So I'm a big believer in this now. Everybody's getting this. Um, it's funny, when I started practicing in 2000, I was doing this, and then um, they actually called it the Vipon cocktail in the emerge that I was working, because I was the only one doing this. And then I stopped for about, seven or eight years because I thought, well, I, I started doing this talk and the evidence wasn't that great. But in the last five years, we've got a lot better evidence that this is the way to go. Um, just quickly, to, sorry? Six hours. Four times a day. And I like to give it regularly. I tell my patients that it's easier to keep pain from coming back than it is to get rid of it once it's there. Um, and... Uh, I think there's some good evidence for that. But I also tell them that once the pain starts getting better, they don't have to be taking it every four to six hours. It's PRN. Um, just I, quickly, ibuprofen and oxycodone. There's definitely better evidence for this than there is Tylenol and acetaminophen. Uh, sorry, acetaminophen and, and codeine. Um, so if you're going to use a narcotic, use a narcotic that works. Um, my personal preference, and I don't have any data for this, is, is um, hydromorphone is dilaudid. I think there's also good evidence that we shouldn't be giving combination analgesics at all because you really want to maximize your acetaminophen dose. You want to maximize your ibuprofen dose. And then that narcotic is your breakthrough drug, right? That's when, oh, I broke my rib and I banged it against the table and, oh, I'm in a lot of pain. Or I'm going to bed and I can't sleep at night and I've maxed out my Tylenol or my acetaminophen and ibuprofen and I need a little bit of a bump up. Um, that's when that narcotic... Um, plays that role. And I always give them that speech. This is, has side effects. You can't be driving on this. You're going to be constipated. It takes a laxative if you need it. Um, remember that addictions are bad. Keep, a, uh, keep an eye out for that. If you start taking the medication for any reason other than pain, that's not a good thing. Uh, just more on that. I think, I think I've hit that enough. Um, so uh, anybody practice with kids? I, mean, I guess you're all rural. Of course, there's going to be kids coming through. Um, interesting enough, there's not as good evidence for using ibuprofen and oxycodone uh, in children. And certainly more adverse effects in using this combination. And there's only one study, so take that for what it's worth. Um, and here's a, a, a Cochrane review of adding the oxycodone to ibuprofen. Number needed to treat 2.3. Not bad. Um, certainly a little bit of a bump up um, from just ibuprofen 400 alone. Um, and yeah, I think that's about there. Number needed to harm is infinite in all groups, so not a, not a big deal. Um, here's uh, Percocet or acetaminophen with oxycodone compared to the ibuprofen with oxycodone. About the same. The big difference is the number needed to harm. Um, it's a higher dose of of oxycodone there. So that's probably attributing to that. So that's kind of it. Let's go back to these scenarios. That, uh, I don't know if you were at the beginning. These are the two scenarios I had everybody think about. So anybody want to give a preferred drug regime for scenario one? Yeah? Gram Tylenol or Okay. And what I generally do is I do that right off the bat, a gram in 800. I say, I'm going to come back in 45 minutes. 
Now, if I come back in 45, if he's taken, really taken nothing, 98% of these guys are bombing. Like, I don't know what you gave me, but it's awesome. And they get up and they start walking around and you send them home. There'll be a small number that you need a narcotic with. You give that. Sometimes you have that fails. And I'll give a little bit of a benzo. Not that there's a lot of evidence for that, but it seems to work for me sometimes. I'm trying to get them home. I don't want to admit this patient to the hospital. Because if I failed these meds, like there's nothing else other than IV drugs. Um, and then um, if that doesn't work, sometimes I've given them low-dose ketamine. And I managed to get them home with that. So that's kind of my scale. I give 0.2 milligrams per kilogram IV infusion over two hours. And that'll sometimes work. Yeah. Now, what about muscle relaxants? The evidence for muscle relaxants is super poor, and the evidence for harm is super high, both with sedation and, and increased falls. Um, so I don't tend to prescribe them. Um, lorazepam, one milligram, is my muscle relaxant if I have to go down that path. What about the second uh, scenario? Do we have any? Thoughts there? Yeah, so this is where you use the diclofenac gel. It'd be perfect for her. She's higher risk, she's older. Um, I know the data I said was over 75, but I'm like super cautious, so anybody over 65 I just consider um, at higher risk, and this would be somebody I would go straight to the Elma gel. Yeah? Um, in the context of sort of acute abdominal pain, I've had staff shy away from using NSAIDs because of concerns of sort of delayed presentation of peritonitis. Did you? If somebody comes in with abdominal pain, I'm going to try and figure out what it is, and I don't think analgesia gets in the way. Like when I started practicing, they wouldn't give patients narcotics um, because there was some idea that it would hide the peritonitis. I don't know of any evidence saying that NSAIDs have a similar risk to this. And I think our job, one of our jobs, other than diagnosing bad stuff, is relief of pain and suffering. And I think there's a huge rule of that. So yeah, I'm, I'm using, um, I mean, for renal colic, NSAIDs are your number one for sure, and then a narcotic on top of that. But I also would argue, and that's because of the, the prostaglandins and the smooth muscles and the ureters, um, but I would argue that for biliary colic and, and appendicitis and uh, diverticulitis, like why not go, go to these drugs first? I don't know if anybody's had narcotics in the eMERGE. Um, they're not very fun. Like, I had renal colic, and they doped me up with morphine. I don't remember that day. I don't know how they got consent out of me, because I <laughs> remember them talking to me about consent, but I don't think that was really valid consent, really. This question over here. I'm just curious, as far as um, if you're going to be giving uh, NSAIDs and let's say, a low-risk patient, and you're deciding if you want to use some analog or not, is there sort of a duration that you'd say, like, well, if you're going to be on this for more than a week, you should probably be taking uh, something for your stomach, but, or is it? Depends on the age, so I'm not too worried about young people, and I'm never prescribing more than a week's worth, especially for narcotics. You should really be, if you're an eMERGE doc, um, you should really only be using those narcotics for as long as they can get to the family doctor, because you really need that single point of source. But, but even for NSAIDs, <laughs> um, but even for NSAIDs, like, they shouldn't really not be on it for more than a week before seeing somebody. Yeah, question in the back. No. I do consider CHF. Um, we didn't talk about that. There is a risk of exacerbations of CHF with this. But remember what hypertension is. It's a long-term disease that increases your risk of stroke and heart attack. It's not a disease in itself. It's a risk factor. So if I increase their blood pressure from 140 to 160 for the period of time that they're on the ibuprofen, which is, remember this is acute pain, not chronic pain, um, I don't care. Like. I don't know of any patient-oriented outcomes that say that's an issue. So I feel like they always have to unpack that yeah. before I can get people to buy in and say, you know, this combination might work. I think there's data in the chronic study that any NSAID longer than two weeks will double your risk of MI, just like having hypertension, whether it be an obese or having an alcohol use disorder. Mm -hmm. So if you start piling all those things on top, especially in diabetics, that could be a problem. But, like, we're always, we're talking about short-term Mm -hmm. So that's where that comes from, because they don't know how long they're, they give them the bottle and they don't know how long they're taking it for, right? So they got to be very cautious. 
And there is a very small risk of all the NSAIDs of increased heart attacks, but it's very small. And we don't really know who those are. Yeah. Right. But I rarely send a patient home that's in severe pain. So even if I give them the dose of the acetaminophen and ibuprofen, whether it's a sore throat or an ankle sprain, I will almost always say, and I'm going to come back in 45 minutes and see how you're doing. And 98% of the time, they're doing way better, and they're like, thanks, doc, this is awesome. I'm going to the pharmacy to get my non-prescription pain medications. <clears throat> Um, so they're their own trial. Like that's that um, N of one, <laughs> right? If you have the N of one, this is going to work for you. Uh, they're happy because that's why they're there. They're not there for a piece of paper. They're there for the pain. I think we may, I think there's evidence that doctors think that prescriptions are a big deal, and that's why we give antibiotics for colds. But if you actually look at the data behind, if you take the extra 45 seconds to explain to a patient why you're not giving them the antibiotic, they're just as happy. Question um, in response to that question, um, I was like, when was the second era? Did you guys get the Jewish registry study where in Denmark everything is pretty much going through the registry? And it reviewed some of the, um, I can't remember the name of it. Yeah. Um, so just a couple of things to emphasize. If they come in and you emerge, and you think they're going to go home, and they don't have intractable vomiting, go with oral first. The reason why you're doing the oral is just what I said. You want to prove to them that they're going to be okay. And you also want to prove to yourself that they're going to be okay with the regime that you're giving. And so they can't take IV Ketorolac. They can't take IV narcotics at home. So don't give it to them. If you think they're going home, take them with that. And most of the people have been suffering with this pain for a while. The person with the back pain, I've had this for two weeks. Yesterday, I tweaked my back. For the last 18 hours, I've been able to get out of bed. Well, if they've been like this for 18 hours, they don't need to get better in five minutes. They're okay with being better in 45 minutes. They just want to get better. They don't care about that time. Now, certain diseases like renal colic, um, which uh, is hell on wheels, that would be the exception to that rule because you want to get their pain out of control and get them out of that pain cycle. Um, Max out your analgesics. Use the gram of, of acetaminophen. Use 600 or 800 of ibuprofen if you can. People over the age of 55, I just dropped that down to 400 because we know there's a dose-related response. So you get older, you get a lower drug. You get older, you get a PPI. Um, so think about other non-narcotics, non-analgesics non that you might not think of. Buscapan. Uh, I have this fight with my pharmacist all the time. We have a pharmacist in the eMERGE. He won't put buscopan in the eMERGE. I said, there's evidence that it doesn't work. Well, you look at the evidence, it's for abdominal pain. I'm not giving it for abdominal pain. I'm giving it for gastrointestinal cramping. Somebody comes in with um, a G like obvious gastroenteritis. They're having that, you know that feeling when you, get, you just feel everything twist up and then it kind of releases again? Buscopan works great for that. And it's not a narcotic. Why should I be forced to give a narcotic to somebody um, because the pharmacist doesn't believe in it? I think buscopan's great. We should be using more um, uh, local anesthetics. Anybody doing trigger injections for back pain? Yeah, it's great. To ask the patient, where the f I'm going to push on your back. You tell me the three worst places, and I'm going to put freezing in all of those places. I can't tell you how many people have come in with headaches. They've had their CT. They've had their LP. And then I go and I see them. I'm like, does it hurt if I do this? And they're like, yeah, it hurts right there. And I put three mils of bupivacaine in there and their pain's gone. They're like, doctor, you're a genius. Um, <laughs> trigger point injections are awesome. We should be using more of them. Um, almost always use bupivacaine instead of lidocaine for your suturing. The pain's not going to go away once you've sutured them up. Why don't you give them a good night's sleep? Use the long-acting one. There's no benefit to using a short-acting one in, in, in suturing or in other uh, sh short procedures. Um, don't use crappy PO narcotics. Skip the tramadol and the codeine. Go straight to morphine or hydromorphone. Um, it's that risk benefit. So just to 
to go to the summary, um, I mean, you guys heard me say this a million times. Use more NSAIDs and Tylenol. They're great. Use more topical um, uh, NSAIDs. Um, PPIs along with NSAIDs are the way to go to prevent risks. Um, stay away from Tylenol 3s unless they, like, the doc, this is the best drug that works for me. And that's it. I'm happy to take more questions. Um, I have four minutes before my talk's over. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I don't know what the basis of that, other than somebody decided that was the way to go. Um, that all these studies, when they're combining it, it's all given at the same time. So I, I, I don't know of any evidence for that. And I can't pharmacologically think of why that would be better. Yeah? I'm just wondering, uh, you 